Hey everyone, this is Paul. And this is Jared Markle. With Student of the Gun. And we just wanted to wish you a happy holidays and a Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. And remember, fighting solves everything. Everything. All right, all right, all right, lead heads. We are back with another episode of the one and only Talking Lead Podcast. Appreciate you guys joining us, tuning in, especially uh, during this busy time of the year with Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, all that rolled up into one. Everybody's got uh, other priorities, and we're glad that you make the Talking Lead Podcast one of those priorities. You lead heads are the best. If you didn't get an opportunity, make sure you go back to last episode where we had Casey Betzold and we talked about his new rule, rule, his new rule, I think it's his new role is what I was trying to say, at uh, Fioki Ammunition and uh, them joining the Talking Lead Podcast family of sponsors. So Fioki is now an official sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast. So make sure you go and show them all the love and thanks that they deserve because you know that they're going to be bringing it back to you lead heads with some giveaways and cool discounts. So this week, I mean, we've kind of been neglecting un, I guess it's an unwritten partnership that we have with these guys. Uh, we've not had them on in a while. Uh, there's a good reason for that. They've been busy uh, uh, doing other things and we're going to talk about that. But we've got our good buddies from the Student of the Gun. We've got Professor Paul Markle joining us. Paul, welcome in. Hey. You know, the last time we were together was when you were here in our studio. I know. That's been several months was, ago. Is it April? It was the, it, wasn't it the end of April? When did, you, when did uh, your, your, your boy do the three-mile rifle shot? Yeah, I know. I, I can't. Th- there's so much that has happened since then. But uh, I think it was around April. I think you're right. Yeah, towards the end of April. I think it was around the end of April. That was actually a crazy time. We had Jacob Herman. Yeah, uh, Jacob was here. Yeah, we Jacob here. was on the on the radio with us, and you were on the radio with us, and Jeff Kirkham Jeff was on. Jeff Kirkham. I mean, it was it was an all star cast. We had a great time. We produced a ton of material in that just just that one week. I mean, with Jacob alone, you could do a whole year's worth of material. <laughs> you you could you could just like say good morning how are you doing today and then sh- close your mouth and an hour later <laughs> I remember that shut that off <laughs> when when you you had to go at the end and you came in you're like I have to go do not leave Jacob unattended <laughs> yeah, I will he, he needs supervision he just needs supervision sometimes that's all well like we say you know, bless his heart <laughs> yeah bless our well uh, yeah Marty we definitely have some history uh, talking lead and student of the gun were. A couple of the, and not the pilot shows, but a couple of the original pilot shows on the Firearms Radio Network. I would say back. anchor shows. Plus years ago. <laughs> anchor shows. The anchor shows, yeah. That's no kidding. One. There you go. No kidding. Uh, and, th- you know, when you did you hit like February of 03? Was it, what's your anniversary? Oh, or, it's this month, it? December. This is uh, seven years okay. this, this month. Because our and our our anniversary is March. March. Our seven year anniversary is in March. Okay, March of twenty twenty. Yeah. Okay, I thought uh, you guys basically. started before we did. Well, I started the TV show in two thousand ten. Mm. We started the radio gotcha. show actually in twenty thirteen. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, yeah, we we both uh, you know kind of cut our teeth on the Firearms Radio Network and uh, kind of went off and did our own things and. You know, we're back with the Firearms Radio Network now that it got taken over with better management. (laughs) Come on. I I will say, and uh, Sean has been doing an excellent job in growing that network, and uh, kudos kudos to Sean. So you guys check out his podcast. He's got, what, like 15 or 20? I don't know how many. We like to shoot guns radio. We shoot guns. We We like like shooting shooting guns. Tw- this weekend, gun. I mean, I don't know. He's got like a blue bazillion different ones. So. Kudos yes, to him. But uh, so. yeah, man, we uh, we go back a long ways, and I mean, you're one of our first guests that we had on the show. Yeah, we, all the way back to the uh, 
the NRA in Houston, Texas, when we all oh, yeah. when we were all together at the same time. That was our first uh, big event that we attended. Yeah, yeah, that was a zoo. That was a zoo. Yeah. I don't want to go back to Houston, Texas for anything. Much well, so. you know, coming up, it's going to be here in my backyard. Uh, in yeah, twenty twenty. NRA will be in Nashville. That's right. Uh, the national NRA is good though. It, I mean, I've been to it twice, and, and it's the national NRA is really good, and the Louisville one is really good. Yeah, I enjoy the Louisville one also. Um, I mean, I, I like the Indianapolis one. It was okay. I didn't have a problem with Indianapolis. It's a nice, clean city. I, I didn't go there. I didn't yeah. go there this year, but I went or uh, I went the previous time that it was there. Yeah, it was uh, the only part that I didn't like is that getting from the airport to the downtown area. Yeah, it took about an hour or so with the ubers and stuff but that's fine the experience once i got there was great yeah absolutely so you guys are coming to nashville uh yeah yeah we will be that's the i don't know what the date is i'm sure it's like the 28 29 around the same time it always is yeah Yeah. so it's either the last weekend in april or first weekend in may we will definitely go out and have uh, some beverages or two uh maybe buck henry might make a yeah, Buck Henry might make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> as long as he's not buck naked, we're fine. Right. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, you never know. He might be on tour. We don't know. <laughs> I think we could probably reel him in. You reel him in. <laughs> I got connections. So, <laughs> yeah. So, for you guys who don't know, Buck Henry, uh, that's my alter ego, I guess, when we're at uh, these events, Shot Show, NRA. Uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul thinks I look like a uh, an old time like Porter Wagner country uh, country music sensation singer. sensation. There you go. <laughs> well, wait till Shot Show. I got something that'll blow your mind. Of what I'm going to wear at Shot Show? So. Uh-oh. Uh oh. Oh no! You know what they did to us? What? The NRA they moved it up this year. It's April 17, 18, 19. Oh wow! Oh. So they moved it up two weeks. Is that due to elections, maybe, or something? No, it probably has due to commitments of the exhibition hall. Nashville, yeah. Yeah, I'm, Nashville exhibition hall. I'm telling you, man, Nashville has just gone nuts. They are ridiculously busy all the time nowadays. Football, well, hockey. Uh, the It is the bachelorette capital of the world now. No uh, kidding. Yeah. Remember, yeah. yeah. remember we were out at the uh, – on uh, – Beale Street, or not Beale Street, that's in... Broadway. Like, on Broadway. Broadway, yeah. And, and like, every everywhere we went, White. there was a, a bachelorette party. Vales, and yeah, every, every it's place crazy. We went. There and uh, Louisville, too. Was yeah. it Louisville? Yeah, Louisville. I don't know. Was I there for that one? Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, when we went to Louisville, and uh, at, what do they call that? The 4th Street, Street Experience or something like that? 4th they, Street Live. 4th Street Live or 7th yeah. Street Live or whatever. You know what I mean. Oh, yeah. You guys... Those of you who know, who know, and if you don't, you're like, what is these guys talking about? And and also joining us, I, I didn't introduce him yet. He was, uh, I think, taking a little potty break or getting him some coffee. But it? it's <laughs> it's your right hand man, Jared. Jared Markle. Hey guys, this is Jared Markle's voice right here. I had to get some Power Llama to put in my Mac V. Cup. What, what uh, is uh, Power Llama? Uh, power Llama is a, it's a special blend from Black Rifle Coffee Company. Oh, okay. You know, I still haven't got into drinking coffee. I did grab uh, several different types while I was there and uh, brought them back for Pepper, and she's been enjoying them, so she really yeah. likes it. And that's, I just, well, that's something you and Jacob have in common. We don't drink you don't, coffee? You don't drink coffee. I would not have guessed that about him because he is like... No, he drinks like <laughs> he pounds monsters and Red Bulls and, and all the other stuff. But no. See, I don't do that. I just uh, I just do my pre-workout. That gets me going. That's my coffee, whatever the flavor is of the day for the pre-workout. But, uh, yeah, uh, it was a great visit up there in April. Enjoyed getting the tour of the Student of the Gun Studios, the Black Rifle Coffee, uh, Ready Man. What else is in there? Rats. Savage Gentleman. Well, Rats, Savage Gentleman. Savage Gentleman, actually, they they moved out into a retail space. Oh, look at them go. Yep. Yeah, they're, got in, those, they're those in the leather mall. products that people like to buy if they can touch and smell. So online sales aren't aren't as easy as they are in uh, in person. Well, when people can actually sense. take it. Yeah, definitely makes sense. We don't want anybody to see anything we do before. They, no, you just have to. They want them to see our products before they actually buy them. They have to buy them sight unseen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we share a lot of the same listeners. 
And uh, if you're a listener of the Talking Lead podcast and you haven't checked out Student of the Gun yet, as they say, you need to correct yourself and go make that happen. Go subscribe today, right now. Uh, But most of our listeners uh, know the the battle that you've been going through, the fighting that you've been doing, Paul, with with the cancer, and you have kicked it in the nuts, and uh, you're on the road to recovery. If not, what are you about ninety ninety eight percent now? Would you say? Yeah, I'd say I'm probably in about ninety percent. I'm about I'm about seventy. I'm about eighty percent of what I was. Uh, I lost. I dropped fifty pounds. I'm oh, I'm wow. coming back a little at a time, but yeah, I, in that whole experience, I uh, I ended up down about fifty pounds. Uh, and it, I think about forty of it was the beard. Was well, that's patient. what I was saying. That's why I was saying you're about ninety eight percent because two percent of that was the beard. But <laughs> 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 you're all back with the beard. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost afraid to grow it back. I'm afraid it's going to come back all white, a different color, different style. Uh, I know, I know. I, I'm afraid I lost all the color in my face. How yeah. many years did you have that beard? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I. I when I was contracting in in the mid to late two thousands, I had to, I wasn't allowed to have beards or anything because we had to maintain military standard facial hair and haircuts and everything. So yeah. I was pretty clean shaven the whole time I was uh, working as a military contractor. But then when I started student of the gun in uh, two thousand ten, I grew like the goatee, and then the gro- goatee just kind of like went wild. It morphed. It morphed and it grew out. And, yeah. So. Uh, and for a while there, it was pretty wild. And my wife's like, and every time she'd give me a haircut, she'd start trimming and, and trimming back. <laughs> it's like, how do you let it get like this? I'm like, I, I don't let it. I just don't do anything. Yeah. Right. Just, it just does. It just does on its own. It's just that. called neglect, honey. That's right. It's called, <laughs> it's called massive amounts of testosterone. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, no. Um, and, and as we were talking about a little bit before uh, when we got off, when we were off air earlier. Uh, I got diagnosed last February. I knew something was wrong. Went to the doctor, and and then I, you know, had to deal with this about a month's worth of. We know something's wrong, but we're not sure what's wrong. Or and then it's like, oh well, it is cancer, but we're not sure where exactly. Right. I mean, oh, we know it's in that one place, and then they say, but it could be anywhere or everywhere or it, whatever. It's like my mechanic is telling me on the. I got the lead sled in the uh, the shop right now, and I've, he's going through like. 10 different things to try to, you know, find out what the, the problem is. Yeah. Could be this, so let's try this. It might be this, yeah. let's try this. Could be over here. And, of course, and, and every time, they, every every other, every appointment, it's like it's like watching the spindles on the gas pump go around. Zing, ding, 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 oh, ding. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, hey, give me an answer already because I'm running out of money. But <laughs> uh, Yeah, because they don't do that shit for free, do they? Oh, no. There is no cancer anything that is for yeah. free. Life ain't free. Uh, no, it ain't free. Yeah, it's like I, I told somebody. I said, "Staying alive is expensive." <laughs> it, it certainly is. Yeah, it doesn't cost you anything to die, but boy, if you want to keep living, it's expensive. But anyway, well, uh, shit, dying's expensive these days too. Yeah. That's true. Well, I, I don't know how much it costs to to, to cremate you. Multi billion dollar business. <laughs> yeah. So in, in April, well, we we had we moved here to Salt Lake City because we knew that I was going to have to have daily. Seven weeks basically ended up worth of radiation treatment yeah. every day. And that's not something, you know, we lived in a beautiful city, a beautiful town out in the middle of the mountains in, in Wyoming. But believe it or not, there's no cancer facilities in Saratoga, Wyoming. Oh, wow. Yeah, You're I didn't like, think what? that. All 1,600 people and they don't have a cancer hospital. <laughs> 1,600. All 1,600 and they don't have a cancer hospital. Come on. So Come on, Wyoming. Yeah, we, we knew we were, I was going to have to uh, commute or to go every day. And driving a three-hour three, three hour commute was not going to cut it. Uh, and I, I talked to the doctors in Laramie, and I told them that Jared and Alex had been living in Salt Lake City for a while. And he's like, oh, great, because I can recommend you to the Huntsman Cancer Research Center in – we'll do a referral. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and fortunately, Jared, <clears throat> Jared had just – you know, this is a favor of God thing. Jared had just moved Absolutely. into a house <clears> – <throat> And the house, when they rented it, it actually had extra bedrooms, and it was more than they needed, but they thought, oh, well, we could use the extra room. And then, bing, bang, boom, dad gets cancer. Uh, and, and this house is only 15 minutes if traffic is serious, 10 minutes if it's light from the hospital. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. 
as a, you know, it's bad enough going through the treatments all the time. Uh, you don't want to be in a car. Oh, commute. no. No, absolutely you know? not. Uh, so I, I got through that. But before I even started treatment, I was on the phone with James Yeager. And he said, he, he was, we were talking about everything that's going on. And yeah. He said, what are you? And I said, and he kind of gave me the, the coach thing. You know, he grabbed me by, he grabbed me by my, my shoulder pads and he, he shook me and he said, what are you? And I said, I'm a writer. And he said, then you have to write about this. And I said, you're right, I know. So I started the book, actually, before I started treatment. And, and that's man, what we're getting to, is, is Paul has written a book about this. And, yeah. And we're going to talk about that book. But first, I hear that jack wagon train rolling in, guys. <laughs> Gunny, bring that train in. We're going to take care of some jack wagons, and we're going to hear more about uh, Paul's fighting solves everything. Hey, Ralph, Semper do or die, hold them high at 8th and I. It is time for the Talking Lead Jack Wagon of the Week, so brace yourself, baby. All right, so the train has stationed, and I'm going to go to one of our listener-submitted Jack Wagons first. And as you guys have heard, I'm calling this the, the Trains and Planes segment now because we're going to do our heroes also. So this is from Jason Farmer, and he says, Lefty, hi, Lefty. I haven't submitted any Jack Wagons in a while, but I have a, a doozy for you today. As you might have heard, Virginia has turned blue overnight, and Virginia is facing the most extreme and unconstitutional gun laws in the country now. These laws even go so far as to put bans on firearm training. I won't give you all the crazy laws that are being introduced. They can be easily found, but it makes California look like Texas. Oh, wow. That's an, that's an extreme that's analogy place. right there. I am putting the Virginia governor, Ralph Northern, on the jack wagon train and introducing and pushing these asinine laws. The governor has been in the spotlight for blackface yearbook pictures that included a second person in KKK costume. It is still unclear which costume he wore. If he had an R at the end of his name, he would have already been crucified and ran out of politics for life. He has also condoned emphasize or the idea of abortion after birth. The governor of Virginia wants to turn the state completely around and force gun control down Virginia's throats with the vote of a very few populated northern counties. This is why I'm placing him on the jack wagon train where I hope tar and feathering is also allowed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we throw them underneath the train too, so I guess tar and feathering is allowed. Why not? Right? There you go. Okay, I just have a quick question for those of you that are in Virginia. Did it actually happen overnight, or has this been coming for a long time and it's just a result of nothing being done to oppose it? Exactly. Uh, and, and I don't Virginia? know because I don't live in Virginia. No, I tell, you, I tell you what happened. Bloomberg funneled like $100 billion or $100 million or whatever, like seriously millions and millions of dollars uh, into the the campaigns of all right. these Democrats and the governor. Yeah. And your your writer is exact, is 100% spot on. If Nordham would have had an R behind his name, if he was the governor of Oklahoma or South Carolina or some other place, uh, and all that stuff surfaced, you see, because there's obvi there's two standards. There's a standard for Christians, Republicans, and, and oh, absolutely. conservative white men, and then there's a standard for everybody else. And, uh, yeah, if it would have been, if he would have had an R behind his name, they would have, you know, he'd be he, out of office. Yeah, he'd already. Oh be yeah, done. he'd be out of office. He'd have had to apologize and everything. But he'd be ruined. He'd be he'd be a farmer somewhere. Yeah, but uh, if you're a Democrat, you can get away with anything because they have no morals or standards, uh, other than they want to be in power. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Bloomberg. It's not really a secret that Bloomberg has been the the largest financial backer of the Democrats in Virginia. And you know, Bloomberg when he was in New York, he was always remember when when uh, it wasn't, and everyone said, hey hey, all of your gun laws in New York failed and he's like it's not it's not us they're coming from virginia how many of you guys remember that <laughs> yeah yeah they're they're blaming, blaming other all the states violence yeah. in new york because virginia didn't have strict enough gun laws and that's where the evil guns were coming from yeah so he's uh he's put his evil you know tentacles down there into virginia and and we've always known that the you know the the virginia portion that's up uh, you know up northeast against washington dc has been infected sure uh, yeah, it's Alexandria County, right? Is the one that's that's right across the river from DC. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So right. I mean, we've we've known that for a long, long time, but it's the poison is spread. It's like it's kind of like arsenic. It's not cyanide kills you immediately. It either kills you or it doesn't. Yeah, arsenic takes arsenic time. It builds up over time. Yeah. 
till and and you don't even realize it until you're dead. And that's what's is, happening all over our country. You know, it's slowly getting arsenic. into yeah to people's systems and the the apathy. Is it apathy? Is that the word I want to look for? What is it? Uh, the, apathy. When you look the other way. Yeah. You know, yeah, apathetic. You're they're like, well, it's it's not. It's not happening to me right now. It doesn't, my doesn't directly well, affect yeah. me, so I don't need to do anything about it. You know, that, right. that attitude has to change. So Jason goes on to say, he says, on a good note is the calls to gun control have also awoken a sleeping giant. The people awesome. of the state of Virginia have gathered and are now demanding for Second Amendment sanctuary status over their individual counties. So the people's grassroots efforts to fight Ralph his unconstitutional gun control is my hero nomination. Another hero in this fight that I must give credit to is Sheriff of Culpeper County, Wash or VA, who was promised to deputize thousands of his constituents if any bill threatens their constitutional right to own firearms or impacts their ability to defend themselves or their loved ones. People of Virginia, stay strong. Continue the fight. Uh, continue the good fight. Leadhead Jason Farmer. So those are good nominations, Jason. Thank you for sending yep. those in. And definitely uh, Sheriff of Culpeper County, uh, he's going to get a ride on Lead Force One and the, uh, the people that are fighting this there. Uh, we're behind you, Virginia. You lead heads that are in Virginia. Um, you know, make the post. Make, this a, uh, a, make people know about this. You know, don't just sit back and let it happen. Um, call for help. You know, fight. Keep fighting. Right, Paul? Yeah, and, and we need to make sure that, like this, this sheriff, that we support those who support us. You know, when these guys, you know, politicians and sheriffs are politicians, uh, when, when they stick their necks out, we, they need to know that the people are behind him. And there, there should be no doubt in this guy's mind that the people are behind him, that all the people are behind him. Uh, we can't just say, oh, good, go carry my weight for me. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that's what we do a lot. We, we think that, uh, and uh, the our side, the Republican, conservative, constitutionalist, whatever you want to call us, we think that well, we elected the right person now. Now we can check out and go play games and not pay attention, and they'll make sure that we stay safe. Yeah, but that's not that does not what's happening. Uh, that we can't check out. We we can't. We're looking, just say, we're looking oh, for one champion, else. and you know, yeah, searching. We've for all got to be champions. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's what the United States of America is supposed to be about. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be about citizens being engaged not just saying oh well if i give this guy enough power he'll keep me safe and give me what i want and now i can go play games and check out yeah exactly is, and this sheriff's name is uh, scott jenkins it's uh, sh uh sheriff scott jenkins so we want to yep. make sure we get his name out there and get him the uh the credit that he deserves yeah it's like if you don't stick up for the sheriff or the people that stand up for us, it's like when you hold the door open for somebody and they walk through and they don't have the gosh darn commons courtesy to say thank you. Say thank you. You're <laughs> like, I just want to slam this door in your face now. Mm -hmm. And if you don't support these people that support us. That's probably how they feel. Right. Well, and there, there, how many other Scott Jenkins could there be out there? How many other county sheriffs are out there? Well, heck, we had one in California that said, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. Come get your concealed carry permit. Mm hmm. And you, you when and there could be some guy, there could be some sheriffs out there that are kind of on the fence. Mm -hmm. Like, which way should I go? They just need the support. They need to know they that people know. are going to back them. Yes, they absolutely need to know that you that you will stand behind them. Yeah, so. exactly. All right, good nominations there, um, Jason. So I've got one, and uh, this comes from the Blaze, and uh, it says, "Woman protesting with Antifa tries rushing police line, but cops aren't playing and shove her right to the pavement." So, I missed that. So this says a group of Antifa militants stage a protest in Seattle over the weekend. Uh, this is Dave Urbanski, I think, is the author of this. Um, conservative journalist Andy Ngo reported, and the notoriously violent leftists did their usual Antifa thing, dressing in black hoodies, wearing masks, and taunting police. The officers appeared to be protecting a small group of pro-America demonstrators. At one point, the Antifa militants burned a thin blue line American flag while standing at the base of the statue of John Hart McGraw, Washington's second governor. But a police officer sprayed the fire out, which ignited anger among Antifa militants. <laughs> it's just, it was just they're angry all the time, you know? It's just like they're angry. They just can't get over their angriness. Uh, mm -hmm. 
One militant actually yelled at the cop uh, who doused the flames. What the fuck is going wrong with you? Uh, another Antifa guy shouted, Suck a dick, you fat motherfuckers. Undeterred, the Antifa faithful grabbed the partially burned flag and lit it on fire, which made them all very happy, including one woman protesting with Antifa, who stood out due to her lack of mask and the pink accents with her clothing. Uh, at another point, amid Antifa's antics, that same woman decked out in the pink tried rushing the cop's bike line, Video shows her running at the officers and getting shoved back. Um, most folks at this point would acquire some mental clarity and conclude that messing with cops in this way is a bad idea. But this Antifa were, uh, let's see, but this is Antifa we're talking about. And given that they tend to get away with a, quite a bit, and they do, they get away with far more than they, they should. Again, Absolutely. the double standards that we were talking about earlier. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I mean these these guys are they're terrorists, is what they are. They are. They're absolutely terrorists, and, and they're and they're they're there's no, they're no different than a spoiled five year old child who th- who every time he throws a tantrum rather than being disciplined gets a cookie. That's that's a great you know? analogy. Yes, that, that it's ex- I mean it's it's no different. This this is the mentality we're dealing with is is a spoiled child, and uh, and. In the United, we can eat, we can do one of two. You know, it's like a spoiled child. They're going to go as far as as you'll let them go, and uh, if you don't step up and correct them, they will never correct their behavior themselves. Absolutely, and it's. I mean, I'm glad to see some of these cops are pushing back. Um, I'm sure that they're going to get uh, repercussions over this. They'll probably get suspended or something like this. But uh, the woman tried it again, and basically they shoved her back. She landed on her ass. Um, and then the other uh, Antifa militants ran over to help the woman up and move her away from the police. Mm. And one officer made it very clear to them all, do not rush into a bike, a bike line. Uh, mm. Again, listen to the police. You don't want to get shot. You don't want to get hurt. Mm. <laughs> do, what, do what you're told. Well, don't be a communist a-hole. And, uh, and they're holding they, a Russian they, flag, too. Yeah, they're holding a Russian flag in front of this statue. These all right. They actually, these people are, are they're useful idiots. And, uh, it's kind of like, does, does no one know the history of the brown shirts and, and the, and the SS? Did you learn about that in school? Jerry, did you learn about yeah, the, the, yeah, we the even learned about that. All right. The S, the, the brown shirts were the SA. What happened to the SA when Hitler, when Hitler gained power? There was this little night called the night of the long knives. There you go. Night the night of the long, long knives. knives. Um, crystal the, the S, is different. The SA, the brown shirts were Hitler's. They were his thugs. Uh, until he got power and then he needed to consolidate power with the actual established military and he didn't need them anymore. Bye bye. And so, uh, on the night of the long knives, all of the, the SA leadership, they were all assassinated and they went away. They all went bye bye because they didn't need the useful idiots anymore. Yeah. And these, these are the useful idiots that will be the, you know, if they ever get their wish, if they ever get what they're wishing for, they will be the SA. They will be the useful idiots that are disposed of. Mm-hmm. And then they're just, they're just too wrapped up in, in, in it, it, it all goes, it comes back to the, this mentality of, it's a completely selfish, self-involved mentality. These are spoiled little babies who never had to do anything difficult in their lives. They, they've had, you know, they get, college grants and, and scholarships and giveaways and their mommies and daddies. You know, the Marty, you know, the history of, of, uh, of communist terrorism in Europe. I I'm assuming cause you're almost my age. I, I am almost your age, but I am sure that you are, are more scholar in that than I am. So give us, well, some, the, give us a little the, lesson. The age and uh, like the, you the are the Bob, professor, <laughs> the Bader Meinhof gang, uh, the, the, in, uh, in Germany, you had the you had the the, the red brigades. In, in Italy, you had the Bader Meinhof gang, the uh, the Red Army faction, uh, and then you had all these other cells in, throughout Europe, and then you had them in the Netherlands and so forth. Right. But historically, when when they when they captured these people and and they tried them, and a lot of them got killed during raids and what have you, they found out that these were not the poor and oppressed. You know, that's what they spout. 
Mm-hmm. They spouted that we are for the working man and the people and the, the man who works the land and the blah, 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 blah. Uh, but they weren't. They were all upper middle class, some, some children of wealthy people who were just spoiled babies. They were. They were a bunch of entitled, spoiled brats. Entitlement. Yeah. And that's exactly what we have right here on, on display. We have a bunch of entitled, spoiled brats. Exactly. That's exactly what that is. All right. So and do you guys have any jack wagons? Anybody you want to throw on the jack wagon train? Uh-huh. We we got lots, but it's your show. Just just drive on. <laughs> no, I mean if something comes to mind. Let's you know. Let's hit them up. Let's get them on there. Let's let's call them out. And again, right. you know, it's about educating and letting people know uh, what's what's going on out there. Yeah. Well, we could talk about the. I think we're already going to talk about it. Though. Yeah, we're going to talk about Florida. Yeah. Okay. Florida. Yeah, that's that, coming up. So yeah. let's let's do this one. This comes to us. Uh, we're going to get to our heroes now. So uh, and we may throw some more jack wagons on, but. Uh, we're going to switch gears. We're going to start uh, talking about some of our Lead Head Brigade heroes here. And this comes from our good buddy, Kenny Ortega. Kenny's a longtime uh, Lead Head. Kenny? Yeah. You guys know Kenny. Kenny. Uh, he sends this one in. Armed Citizen Saves the Day Stops Attack in Best Buy Parking Lot. Uh, and this is on BearingArms.com if you guys want to look this up. An armed citizen was forced to draw his gun and defend the life of a couple of Best Buy employees in Moore, Oklahoma. Thankfully, was able to do so without ever having to pull the trigger. It all started with when three thieves decided to apply a five-finger discount to thousands of dollars of electronics at the Best Buy. According to authorities, loss prevention employees were able to stop one of the suspects at the door, but two others managed to make it to their getaway car. Instead of driving away, however, they ended up driving straight towards those employees and the suspects, uh, the suspect they had pinned to the ground. Uh, So let's cut down to the chase here. The bystander said he believed they missed, then reversed, and it looked like they were going to charge again. That's when he said he decided to draw his weapon and point it towards the driver. He said the driver stopped, put his hands up, then drove away from the scene. Sergeant Lewis said police don't encourage civilians to draw their weapons because it could result in worsening an already dangerous situation. Are you kidding me? <laughs> There's right? one for you. There's a jack wagon. Yeah. Sergeant Lewis, jack wagon. Uh, however, in this case, he said the bystander was well within the law. So, you think? So now we're taking him off the jack wagon train. Uh, if an individual feels like they're doing a service by protecting themselves or someone else that may be injured, then it's hard to say they did the wrong thing. Uh, Sergeant Lewis said, "In this now, situation, this, this guy's like Charlie Brown. He's all he's wishy washy. It turned like, out for the best. Yeah, I mean, he's not. Well, this time it did, but we. Right, he's being PC. All, for, being PC. Yeah. All right. For those of you in your audience that don't know, I I used to wear the uniform. I wore the blue uniform, the polyester uniform with the badge and the Sam Brown belt. I was a police officer. In blue line, yes, sir. Yeah, and so for this guy to say." Well, we don't encourage civilians to draw their weapons because it could make a bad situation worse. Okay, go fornicate yourself. <laughs> don't don't come out here with this with this freaking PC crap. You, criminals are not afraid of police. Hate to break your heart, but criminals are not afraid of police. Police are just a part of their everyday lives. It's a game that they play. Mm-hmm. The only people that criminals are actually of in fear of is arms is the an armed victim. That is their greatest fear because an armed victim doesn't have to arrest them. Doesn't it, An armed victim is not worried that their chief will be mad at them for u- excessive use of force or whatever. Um, the armed victim is the only thing that a criminal actually fears. They don't fear the cops because they know the cops have to, by law, use as much restraint as possible. They like take- soft targets. It's, it's and a they're fact. not afraid of going to court or going to jail. That's just part, that's part of a game that they play. And for a police officer to go in public and say, we don't encourage mere mere peasants. We don't encourage the peasants to to resort to the sword because the sword is reserved for His Majesty the King and His Majesty's troops. Fornicate yourself, Sergeant <laughs> Lewis. There you go. Back on the jack wagon train, Sergeant Lewis. It's also worth noting that Oklahoma is a permitless carry state, which means no license is required to legal for legal gun owners to lawfully carry their firearms. Gun control advocates claim that the law, which went into effect earlier this year, would lead to Wild West shootouts across the state. There'll be blood in the streets. Right. The Uh, Wild West. 
best. Black Friday was just to be a big, uh, a big um, shootout. We haven't seen anything like that happen. Instead, we've mostly seen stories of gun owners acting responsibly to protect themselves and others. Uh, with one notable exception being the self-proclaimed Second Amendment auditor who got himself arrested for carrying where it's not allowed. Fully expect to see more of the same in the future. Yeah. Uh, so, there you go. Hero right. hero, and Jack Wagon on the same same story. There. Same story, yeah. Yeah, I like that. So, another one that we've got here. This comes from... Who's this come from? We got Eric, Leadhead Eric, and he's not got a pre. No, his is the same. He's got the um, the Culpeper Virginia sergeant. So we got him. We talked about him. Lead Force One, Pierce Taylor is sending this one in. Leadhead Pierce, come on, mouse work, and <laughs> and this will get to to what you what we were going to talk about earlier. So uh, the Pensacola shooting. I'm sure everyone is. Uh, familiar with this and there were several uh, brave individuals that put themselves in harm's way um, made the ultimate sacrifice to to try to save their fellow man and um, definitely those are going to be on lead force one Uh, but this guy and you can talk more about this and i posted that instagram uh, post that you put up of the um, of the shooter. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn this over to you and let you talk about that. Okay. Definitely. He's, he's Jack wagon and the people that are trying to protect him. You know, what's, what's messed up, uh, back in 2000, uh, one, two, three, I guess it was, uh, somewhere in the Oh three, Oh four, uh, time frame. I met with a guy who, uh, was re- retired CIA and he was actually in Iran. He was in Tehran when the embassy fell and he had to like find a way out of the country. He was telling me about that. And we were talking about the current situation in 04, which was obviously the jihadist terrorism that we were dealing with and so forth. And he said one of the, one of the, uh, his belief, his personal belief is why, uh, we were dealing with the jihadist type terrorism was because they had nothing to lose. He said most of these people like crap in a hole in the ground. They don't, they've never had hot and cold running water. They've never taken an indoor shower. And he said, uh, if, if they could, if we could get them into a position where they, they had hot and cold running water and indoor plumbing and so forth, then they'd be less likely to engage in these terroristic activities. And of course, you know, back then, 04, that's been 15 years ago. Uh, you know, I nodded my head and I was like, well, this is an older guy and he obviously knows, but I think about it recently. I don't believe that's the case because look at what's going on in Europe. Look at what's going on in here in the United States. We, we have these quote unquote immigrants. I call them invaders who've gone to Europe from the Middle East because they, all they want is a better life. They just want an opportunity for a better, better life. But we give the, they've been given the opportunity for a better life. And what do they do? They, they drive a truck over a hundred people in Nice, France and, and murder them. They, they run people down on the London bridge, jump out with a, uh, you know, machete screaming Aloha snack bar. They yeah. come to the United States, run a U-Haul truck, drive down the main street of New York, running people over and then stabbing them. These people, all these people who did this had the opportunity to, have good things to experience the modern world, hot and cold running water, indoor plumbing and all that stuff. And these guys in Saudi, from Saudi Arabia, these Saudi Arabian nationals and the, the murderer, the jihadist murderer who killed his classmates in Pensacola, he had everything that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. We opened up our home to him. We were kind and generous and I, I think that when you say, when you bring foreign military students into the United States and you allow them to access to your schools and training and so forth, you're opening up your home to them. So we were kind and generous, opened up our home to this guy, and this is how we were repaid. We were repaid with murder. This guy was not living in a cave, crapping in a hole, you know, uh, eating locusts and wild rice or whatever. This guy had access to all the good stuff. And he still didn't care. Again, we're back to the mentality of the the spoiled child, of the overindulged spoiled child who hates everything. I hate you. 
I hate you. But yeah, I isn't that the pattern of these? Everything. Yeah, isn't that the pattern of these um, um, Muslim extremists, jihadists? Uh, anyways, they come over here and they they enjoy the freedoms and uh, luxuries yeah. that we have in our country, which they're not supposed to do. Um, no, but, but in no. the name of uh, you know their God, then they go and then they kill hundreds, thousands of innocent people, yeah. men, women, children. You know what? I, what I say is. Didn't we have, in the United States, have we ever had a problem with Saudi nationals coming to America and training to be pilots? Seems no, like no. that's happened in the past. Is, no, is, is, that, is that ever been a problem before? Is this a brand new thing? Is this the first time this ever happened? <laughs> it's been long enough for people to forget. Yeah, so remember the never forget 9-11 shirts and bumper stickers and everything? We've done long forgot. America's at the mall. America is distracted by whatever the latest app on their iPhone is. Uh, and on one hand, we have Ralph Nordham and, and Bloomberg and, and, the, and the Pelosi's and the Feinstein's and the Schumer's that tell us from their ivory tower palaces, you stupid peasants don't understand and you need to be disarmed because it's the job of the government to keep you safe. We have police and we have 911 and we have this. And, and in, you have no business, Sergeant Lewis, you have no business defending yourself because that is the government's job. The government's job is to is supposed to be to secure our borders and to keep us free from foreign invaders. But instead, what our government has done is they've invited foreign invaders into our country, put them in our cities, on our military bases, and allowed them to murder our citizens. And so while they're doing that, at the same time, they're telling us that we aren't mature, intelligent, or responsible enough to defend ourselves because it's the government's job. The government's doing a crappy job. They're doing a terrible job. This this scumbag, all right, and what's up with the country of Saudi Arabia not vetting their officers? This guy was a freaking officer in the Saudi Arabian Air National Guard. Well, I mean, Gu you think they really didn't know? <laughs> yeah. Well, when, when we know... That his, that his fellow jihadis were sitting there with their phones on horizontal mode videoing it. Right, exactly. Yeah, they knew not to go in the classroom. They knew what was going on. They were hanging out. They were out. fully aware of they what was going to happen. And now there's a bunch of them missing, and the FBI is like, all right, Jared, yesterday we talked about this on the radio, and you probably saw this too, Marty, where the U.S. military bases were, quote, unquote, on high alert. Yeah, but it's not an act of terrorism. Yes, no. Didn't, so the no. FBI says, we're not ready yet to classify this as terrorism out of one side of their mouth. And on the other side, they're like, oh. treating it like it's terrorist act. Yeah. Well, they're like, yeah, all of our military bases are on high alert. And we're, you know, in the city of New York is on high alert because these guys all visited New York two days before the attack. And a bunch of them are missing. We don't know where they are. But it's not terrorism. No. Yeah. I mean, it, it, their actions the whole, they, their actions tell us exactly what they mean. It, it's like Leslie Nielsen standing there waving his arms, yelling, there's nothing to see here. <laughs> Go home. For Just those who don't know who Leslie Nielsen is. Uh, you got to educate yourself, man. Yeah, he's got some, some good movies. Uh, so I want to, uh, again, I want to honor the, the heroes here, uh, the victims. And um, Mohammed Hatham, uh, he was 19. Uh, was murdered. He's from St. Peter, Petersburg, Florida. Ensign Joshua Caleb Watson. He was 23 from Alabama. Airman Cameron Scott Walters was 21 from I can't so young. I know Richmond Hill, Georgia, and uh, I don't you know how Charles is doing. He was a police officer uh, who was who was injured during that. I know he went to the uh, he had to go to the hospital. Um, I don't know Charles's last name, but uh, I made a post on uh, social media about that, that he's in our prayers. Uh, so, yeah, those guys, uh, I mean, above and beyond heroism, mm. they are heroes, and um, they, they are very deserving of a ride on Lead Force One. And I'm going to throw another person on the jack wagon train. Yeah. And you're going to be surprised by this, and, uh -oh. and that's okay. Uh, and your listeners are going to be surprised. Uh, how many of you guys watched the news reports where they brought out the base commander, and the base commander solemnly uh, stood in front of the microphone and said, 
the following happened, and, and this is what's going on. I'm going to throw the base commander on the jack wagon train, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. Okay. And, and remember, Marty, remember when our our, uh, our uh, recruiters, mm-hmm. a bunch of our recruiters in uniform got, got targeted and murdered by jihadis, and we just pretended yes. during the reign of Comrade Barry that it was an isolated lone wolf incident and it had nothing to do with jihadism, terrorism. Right, they didn't call that terrorist, terrorism No, either. no, it's, it's, it's a workplace violence. Uh, it just so happened that they were targeting members of the military in uniform. Yeah. And they were going to place different place to different place. You know, it's like it yeah. all had, happened at one station. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, the Department of Defense actually issued a memorandum, uh, a directive, attention all base commanders, all military base commanders in the United States of America, directing them and giving them specific instructions about allowing, I love the word allow, allow. about enabling, uh, enabling their troops to carry firearms on their persons to be used in self-defense. That was in 2016. Yeah. But it, they left it because the DOD is part of the of government and government is full of, of pol- politicians and bureaucrats. They left it up to the, the individual base commanders to either enact that or to not enact it. And so this base commander in Pensacola made the purposeful decision to not enact that. Mm. His people were disarmed. Um Mohammed Sahid Jihad Salah, whatever porn stash face guy. Um, <laughs> he knew for a fact when he walked into that classroom that he'd be the only one with a gun. Yeah. He yeah. knew it because he knew it was Soft a target. unclean yeah. zone. He knew for a fact that there were great big signs forbidding the good guys. When the good guys went through, rolled through the gate in the morning or the good guys that lived on the base, the good guys that live on the base aren't allowed to have guns in their barracks. It's against the law. It's against the rules. You, members of our military, officers in our military cannot be trusted to possess firearms because you're just too stupid and incompetent. So Unless he you're knew. On duty. He would, Mohammed uh, Major Nidal Hassan, remember when they tried to sell that as a workplace violence incident mm-hmm. and because we're all stupid and supposed to believe that? He knew when he walked into that, you know, deployment readiness center or whatever that he was going to be the only one with a gun yeah and it just goes to show i mean you look case after case after case after case the targets are soft targets gun-free zones where they know they're going to meet least resistance if any at all and do the maximum amount of carnage of damage until somebody with a gun shows up to stop them right and that's their goal and they and they know that they know eventually they're going to get stopped but they're going to just keep going until they somebody shows up. What is it that the liberals and the Democrats always say? How many more kids must die before we take action? Yeah. How many more of our service How members, many more service members must have to die, die before, before we arm they're, them? They're allowed. And in, you know, in addition to the, the cop hat, I wore the, the Marine Corps hat for a while. And I, I know of which I speak. And it's pathetic. And the, and the reason that it's going to keep happening all right, we're going to hail these young men as heroes. Everyone's going to feel sorry and bad for the base commander. And no one's going to look at the base commander and say, you know what? It's your fault. You have three years, three years to get your people spun up and, and ready to defend themselves against these jihadist terrorists that our government welcomed in with open arms and put right smack dab in the middle of our bases. And then we sit here with shocked looks on our faces when the same exact people who pulled off 9-11 murder our people here on our shores. And it's not because they're poor. It's not because they're oppressed. Not because they were living in a cave, crapping in a hole, eating lo- lo- locusts and freaking bugs or whatever. No, it's because they hate us for what we stand for. And we can't be nice enough and we can't, you know, we open up our home to them and they stab us. And that's exactly what's going to happen happening. time after time. It's going to and it's not going to stop it's because keep we keep trying yeah. to apply the same solutions, the same failed solutions to the problem. Yeah, is that how you feel? Pretty much the same. Okay, I just you you preach, brother. You preach. I wrote a book about fighting. <laughs> you did, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, so we're going to wrap up our trains and planes segment here. But first, we're going to do one more, and this comes from Dan. Jason Edgar again. Uh, so Jason's been on it. Uh, this past couple of weeks 
Gary Sinise Foundation sends families of fallen military to Disney this week. Uh, I can't say enough good things about Gary Sinise and his foundation. Uh, he's made the the Lead Head Brigade, Lead Force One. Uh, before, he was actually up to be the pilot for Lead Force One, but he got beat out by the ghost of Charlton Heston, <laughs> <laughs> who, is, who is our pilot uh, for Lead Force One. Uh, but L- Lieutenant Dan and his foundation uh, definitely continuing – the great things that they're doing with his foundation. And, you know, even though he's sending them to a liberal establishment yeah, of, of Walt Disney World, I mean, who, who doesn't have a good time at Walt zone. Disney? But whatever. Um, another, yeah, gun free zone. Uh, but are they, are they actually one of the few that, you know, it's a gun free zone, but are they taking measures to protect the, the unarmed? Where's, oh, well, they, well, they do whatever they do, they do at the airports. They search all the good guys. Yeah, but at the you know, I don't know they what kind of all the security. Guys. Yeah, I don't know what kind yeah. of security they got at the actual. Yeah, theme you know, park. No, nope, it's okay because nobody dies at Disneyland. I haven't heard of anybody. No, you know, you know about the nobody dies at Disneyland thing, right? No, what is it? All right, no one dies at Disneyland. It doesn't matter. You could be decapitated like by a ride. <laughs> I got They're you. Head and your body in a bag, and they would not. They don't I'll never hear about it. it dead until you're at the hospital in orlando no one dies at disney world it never in the paper will you see you know man died at disney world he died was declared dead at the hospital in orlando he had a heart attack at disney world and was transported but you don't die at disney world or disneyland no one dies it's like people don't die at casinos you know i've never thought about that yeah in biloxi do you ever visit us in biloxi man Uh, i uh, I did not yeah you didn't. Well, people don't people don't die at the casinos in Biloxi uh, because it's bad for business. Yeah. And they buy a lot of advertising. So you know, they spend a lot of money on advertising revenue. So we don't report. Uh, I was at a, a hotel casino at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, and there was a, ambulances came in, and we were looking out our window, and there were people gathered around. A kid drowned in the pool, died, right? We knew it. I saw it with my own eyes. Right. Right. The next day in the news, it said a child drowned on the Gulf Coast. Ah, Didn't so they're, they're paying, they're covering the up their stuff. At so. the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, because people don't die at the casino. They, they right. are declared dead somewhere else. So that makes me think with Disney, I mean, you've never heard of a, about a shooting at Disney World. Have, have they actually happened there and have they covered it up? So, well, people if, don't die there. If no. anybody is listening, if you've ever worked at Disney and you've got the inside skinny and you know for a fact that there's been some, some shootings or, knifings or you know whatever well it's like a major metropolitan area it's send a me thing. send me an email talking about gmail.com i want to hear about it they signed an nda so it's going to have to be an expose by a i'll an keep anonymous. you anonymous you yeah, will be yeah, they, anonymous uh well, but actually to, to their credit disney has the coolest cop badges in the world they <laughs> their their cops actually they have real cops right they have like law enforcement guys yeah it's their own city and, but, but their badge looks like mickey mouse oh that's cool yeah so Mickey Mouse cops. Okay. And, <laughs> Mickey Mouse cops. Mickey Mouse, please. <laughs> but Gary Sinise, Lieutenant Dan, is, is a good dude. Yeah, I would love to to meet him. Not had the opportunity to meet him, but you know, he's on my list of people I want to meet. The old bucket list. You know, he's thing. one of those guys that I, I would imagine would, would frequent someplace where, where, where we frequent, like shot shows and NRAs and stuff you would like think. that. Yeah. He seems like he's like right on our side. Yeah, and he may have, and we just, you know. Well, it's like people him. like you know. They, there's a lot of guys that we don't would never know or realize that are like real pro gun or real big sportsmen or whatever. And then you see him on the floor at shot show, and you're like, "This is that what the yeah right? What's he doing?" Yeah, here? Like like Sean Sean Michaels, the wrestler. I didn't know he was a big outdoor sports shooting sports guy. Yeah, and I was at shot show for several years ago. I was in the Springfield booth or something, and I looked. I was like, "Hey, well, we did a good episode Sean- on this with um with Taryn Butler." And talking about, you know, a lot of, I mean, they're just, it's, it's too risky for them to come out and be mm-hmm. public about it uh, yeah. you know, in, in the, in the Hollywood scene. So, uh, but it seems well, like more and more of them are, are starting to come out and feel more comfortable about it. Yeah. And the, well, the fringe guys like, like Post Malone and stuff, he doesn't have to cater to Hollywood culture. Mm-hmm. He doesn't care if he gets invited to you know, a director's party in Hollywood. Uh, And then the wrestling culture, those guys, they're not dependent on Hollywood culture's approval for their ratings. Listen to The Rock. Yeah, you know, listen to The Rock. But uh, those kind of guys, they can 
publicly go to gun, sh- you know, they can go to shop, they can go to NRA, they can be in booths and stuff and not worry that, oh, the, the studio system will, will frown upon it. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, so, and no, speaking of wrestling and fighting, we want to get to yeah. we want to get to your yeah, book. Let's talk about the book. There we man. go. Fighting yeah. solves everything. Yeah. Fighting solves everything. New book by Paul Markle, student of the gun, destroying cancer with faith, nutrition, and science. You've written this book after I mean obviously this life changing uh, event. Uh, you're going to talk about your keto diet, uh, mm-hmm. strength training, avoiding the the pity party, you know, self pity party. And then the the science that you used also to to delve into and and fight this cancer. We've been using the term "fighting solves everything" for a long time on Student of the Gun Radio. We embr- yeah. we embraced it years and years ago, and uh, you know, and when people would say, "Oh, that's that's barbaric" or "that's you know lowbrow" or whatever, you, fighting doesn't solve anything. Yes, it does. It actually solves everything. Uh, you know, if it didn't solve everything, you know, the East Coast of the United States would be speaking German, and all the West Coast and Hawaii would be speaking Japanese if uh, fighting didn't solve everything. If fighting is a it's a mental. Th- State of mind is yeah, not giving up, not quitting. And, and what I would say to people when they would they would poo poo that, and I'd say, look, right? Have you ever known anyone who had cancer? You know, and, and they're like, and this is way before I had it, but they'd say, well, yeah, you know, of course. And I said, what what do the doctors say? Do they say, yeah, we found some cancer in you, but we figured, eh, just leave it there, right? And eventually, mm-hmm. it'll go away. No, what do they say? They say we're going to fight this. Your your family and your friends, you all get together in the, in the living room and you sh- you cry and stuff, and you're like, we're all going to fight. And we're going to fight this, and we need you to fight, 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 fight. Everybody says the word fight, and nobody has a problem with it. Yeah. Nobody ever says, oh, hey, hang on a second there, Mister Cancer Doctor. Don't be saying the word fight because that's not PC or appropriate. No, nobody has a problem with it, but you can't just say fight. You know, looking at somebody and saying. Hey, I want you to fight. And you say, okay. Yeah. They don't tell you what that means and well, how, how to do it. Yeah. How? And, and just surrendering to the medical profession, just like surrendering your body like you're a five-year-old and, and being carted around, you know. Like when you're five, you, you go places because you're basically pulled, pushed, or carried into that place, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, that's not fighting. And fighting is actually taking steps yourself. Uh, to to take care of your own, t- and obviously you need the medical community. You need the machines, and you need this, and you Science need that and technology. Yeah. But but there's a lot of people that that go through the whole procedure and end up expiring anyway, uh, because they just they they get uh, you know, wrapped up in this. I'm a victim, and it's easy. I mean, when you get a phone call that says, "Oh, hey, that lump is actually a tumor, and that tumor is actually cancer," it's pretty easy to just go lay on a couch and and like curl up in a ball and say, I don't, you know, die. Uh, but your, your, your mind needs more than that. And Marty, I'm really glad to be on the radio with you talking about this because you were there when Jared and I, uh, we were all introduced to Matt Reynolds the same time, the same day in the same room. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. uh, Life changer. And well, in like a couple of weeks, I, I looked at some old photos. Oh, well, not that old, but uh, in, it was like the weekend of January 7th and 8th or 8th or 9th of right 2017 yeah. that we were all in Camden, Tennessee at the Fight Strong class. Yeah. And that's where I learned how to properly and correctly lift a barbell, not just watch people in the gym do it, but yeah. actually do it correctly. Yeah. Oh, uh, learned that now, for 30 years I've been doing it wrong, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I just, I, you know, my whole adult male life, I've been like a chimpanzee just mimicking what I saw other people do. Uh, I didn't, I did not know how to deadlift properly. I did not know how to squat properly. You know, as far as benching, you just, that's an ego exercise and mm-hmm. people, so they look cool. Uh, but it was, it was Reynolds that taught me really how to get physically strong. And when I was diagnosed, I was physically stronger demonstrably on paper like no kidding this is not you know wasn't and there's no ego involved in it then i had been in my life yeah. uh, and it was because i followed that program you know i remember one of the things that he said to us too um uh, you know when he was talking about getting actually physically stronger you know, he was like reasons why you would want to physically be stronger and you know one of the examples that he gave is you know when you see somebody who gets you know uh an illness, you know, a really bad illness, you know, what, what happens to them? You know, they start to deteriorate. And right. if you've got more mass that takes longer to, de- 
deteriorate while you're going through this and, and healing and getting better, it's going to make you stronger for the fight. Strong like you're saying. people are harder you to have, kill. You're harder to, that's exactly what it is. You're harder to kill. I love that. I thought that was awesome. And, and it's not always just like crackheads in parking lots trying to kill you. Sometimes it's tumors that are trying to kill you. Right, or pneumonia or you know whatever it may be. Or, yeah, or pneumonia or any kind of a disease. And strong people are harder to kill. And, it's, and strong people are harder for diseases to kill. And Absolutely, yeah. The reason I wrote this book was because I, got, I was very fortunate to get a lot of good advice, a lot of good coaching, and a lot of good mentoring from – I got health and nutrition um, uh, mentoring from Dr. Dan Olesnicki of SWAT Fuel about the keto diet. Um, and the, key, basic, the basic keto diet is, is, is you cut carbohydrates out. And when it comes to cancer, cancer cells feed on sugar. Mm-hmm. It's science. It's, it's not debatable. Uh, and w- when, th- when they scan you, when they put me in the, what they call the PET scan machine, the, uh, and it's kind of like an MRI only it's not quite as claustrophobic and it's not as noisy, yeah. but what they do is they shoot, they inject you with radioactive glucose, <laughs> radioactive sugar. They inject it into your veins. Killer sugar. <laughs> right. And you sit there for an hour or so until it's all the way through your body. Then they stick you in the machine and they scan you from, from scalp to toenails and the reason that, that that works is because the the glucose goes to the cancer cells and it attaches itself to the cancer cells and it feeds it. And so because it's radioactive, um, it, it pings on the machine. It lights up like Christmas and they can say, okay, that's a hot spot, that's a hot spot, that's a hot spot. Anywhere where there's not a tumor or cancer cells, your body just absorbs it. Yeah. But when it goes to the cancer cells, it, it latches on and it stays there. And so... You know, cancer cells and tumors feed on sugar. And Dan's like, look, you're going to deprive the tumor of sugar and you're going to force a metabolic change, which is what happens when you go through the ketogenic diet is it forces a metabolic change. And the great thing about lifting, too, is, well, you know, it's it's what? Stress, Mm -hmm. recovery, adaptation. You stress your body, you break it down, you recover, and then you force it to build itself up stronger than it was before. And it doesn't just strengthen your muscles, it strengthens your bones, and it strengthens your immune system, and it strengthens, and it for, as a man, it forces your body to release growth hormones that kind of had been stagnant. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get north of 40, man, if you're not north of 40, I hate to break, a heart, break your heart. <laughs> yeah, it but happens. You get north Start of 40, now. your body, it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't release the, the hormones that it was releasing when you were 20, 22, 18, or whatever. And when you do strength training, you're, you're, you're forcing your body to do that. Your body's like, well, we got to repair this. So let's do it. Let, let's be stronger. So the reason I wrote the book is because I, I want to inspire people. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, and, and I learned a lot, not just from the, if you rely 100% solely on the medical industry, you'll find that they're not all operating from the same playbook. They're not all on your side either. And, 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 yeah. uh, you know, essentially the, what we learned is that if it's not in the playbook of whatever place you go to, to get treatment, then they're not going to recommend it. And they might even, um, be against it. Be against it. Yeah. Right. And why you say so, not in their playbook, it's, you know, what they're getting paid to do. Yeah, what right. they're, this is what we'll get reimbursed for. About that in in their classes, so they don't want to hear. Like um, the 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 doctors in Wyoming all were down with me being on the ketogenic diet, keto diet, and uh, but in in Utah they're like we don't know what that is and we don't care. But there actually have been scientific studies that show that people who are, do the ketogenic diet during radiation and chemotherapy uh, have a fifty percent greater survival rate than those who don't. That's, That's kind of huge. Point. That's huge. And they just released uh, the Kettering, uh, Kettering Cancer Research and NASA in conjunction just released a report right as I was putting this book together, as I was finalizing it, that they're recommending that people who are going through cancer treatment and post-treatment en- engage in strenuous physical training. Wow. Not just lying on the couch. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, but just when don't I was, sit there and die, yeah. None of the medical people that I, not one single medical person in, 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 let me tell you, when you get diagnosed with cancer, you meet a lot of people. You go, I mean, everybody comes out of the woodwork to talk to you. Uh, not one of them said, hey, you know what you should do to maintain muscle mass? Go to the gym and get strong. No, what they said was you need to keep your weight on. They're like, well, they're like, and they said, we're worried about you losing weight. Right. And muscle mass. 
they use muscle mass. They're like, they did say you- muscle mass. Yeah, they said muscle mass. They're okay. like, we want you to maintain your muscle mass. How do I do that? Eat tofu and peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> eat. That yeah. No eat exercise. Eat tofu and peanut butter and mashed potatoes, and that'll maintain your muscle yeah. mass. And I think that's what a lot of people think when they say you need to maintain your weight. They don't specify, well, you need muscle weight. and this is Yeah, muscle eat. weight. No. Uh, I, uh, I believe from the outside looking in, like obviously I didn't go through the treatment, but I was there watching Dad as he progressed through the treatments. And from the outside looking in, if he – have been strength training for three years or whatever it was, then he would have lost way more than 50 pounds and probably would have not. I, I believe that strength Wouldn't training have had the strength to carry on. Yeah. I think that it really did because you lost 50 pounds mm. and muscle mass, as we know, it stays on longer. Than yes, it does. It stays. It's harder to get rid of. Yeah. It's harder to gain, but it's also harder to get rid of. It stays longer. So, I mean, that's that's the benefit of it. That's the story of life. Yeah. Anything that's hard to get is probably worth keeping. Exactly. And anything that's easy probably isn't going to last and stay around. That's the so, whole thing of building the muscle mass to make yourself harder to kill. Right, exactly. So, I mean, I did strength training. I talk about my faith. I talk about my family. I talk about – and then the science, you know, the science part. Now, the science part also is is – is diet and nutrition and, and strength training, but it's also, of course, you know, what I experienced uh, with the radiation treatments. Yeah, and, and they're sure you're taking some chemicals, putting some crazy things in your and, body. Uh, and I, I did, you know, and, and what I went through with the different, I mean, because they're always trying to figure out which medications work for you best, and some, mm-hmm. of, them do, some of them don't, and some of them make you crazy and see things. And, uh, you know, all the things that I went through and all the things that my wife went through trying to like feed me proper, you know, to feed me a good diet and keep me going and, and what have you. And as a, as a huge bonus benefit, you know, I, I ended up in the hospital and I ended up having to have a tube put in my stomach to be fed. And uh, so Nancy, when I got out, she had to figure out how to feed me through this tube, but give me good, serious nutrition, mm. not a bunch of you know, mashed potatoes and freaking tofu or crap, and peaches. you know, I needed protein and animal fat and, 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 and all, and all that good stuff. Uh, and so she had to figure out all these recipes. So there's, there's keto recipes that go through your mouth, uh, in here that, and, and bless your heart. Like keto coconut cream pie. That's yeah. Funny. Like keto it's coconut delicious. cream pie and keto chili. My and favorite keto pie. Pizza. Mm. And uh, and then also there's there's the blended things. If if you end up with a tube, you don't have to just uh, pour you know this garbage from Walmart that uh, boost and insure were and you, crap like that. Yeah, were you getting uh, were you taking like protein powders and uh, supplements and things like that? Were you getting yeah. that through the tube? Yeah, I mean she would blend everything. She would blend every, We had a, a super blend. I was just blend saying tech. another. The favor of God is one of our wedding gifts from a friend that worked at a company called Blendtec. And if you've seen any of their commercials, their their blenders blend everything. They blended the iPhone up. Yeah. <laughs> one of our friends had given us one of those, Alex and I, for a wedding gift. And I never thought when I received that blender, I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to use this for shakes and stuff. I never would have thought that my mother would be using it to blend up meals for my dad. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and that's another, you know, that's another thing. If, if you have anybody, you know, that has to go through that, especially with the tube, you need the $28 blender from Walmart ain't going to cut it. Mm-hmm. You need like a good commercial grade, uh, one, but, it, but all that's in there. And, and these are all things that, that we had to learn as we went along. Uh, and, and the, the advice that I was given and, and what I did and, and uh, yeah, I, and I'm, and today here I am talking in this black carbon steel microphone, uh, sucking up good oxygen off of planet Earth instead of fertilizing it. So tell and us the timeline when you first were diagnosed to when they, uh, when you got through all this and, and you're cancer free. Yeah, well, the messed up thing is I had the, I noticed this bump in my throat on my neck before I went to Shot Show, mm-hmm. and uh, I remember that. Yeah, I got back and. I was like, well, and, and, you know, the doctor Google said that it might be a, a, a lymph node from an infection or whatever, and it should go away in two weeks and it didn't go away. I'm like, oh, crap. So I went to the doctor and they're like, well, it could be, you know, salivary gland, could be a lymph node. Let's do some stuff. Went to the hospital. They did a thing. And they're like inconclusive results. And they're like, okay, we need more details. Uh, and then finally I ended up and they're like abnormal cell activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I ended up in Laramie with a specialist who you know, stuck a needle in my neck and scoped down the back of my throat. And, and that's, that's when he said, it's definitely a tumor. 
Hey, he goes, I don't know if it's benign or cancerous. He goes, it's a 50-50 shot either way. We'll know in a few days. And then I got the phone call in February, February 22nd. Uh, and he's like, I usually I like to do this in person in the office, but since you're a 90 minute drive away, mm, yeah, I'm just going to tell you it's, it's cancer and you need to get to Cheyenne and you need to create a complete body scan and we need to figure out if it's anywhere else in your body. Then we found out that it wasn't. So that was fantastic. He was like, all right, next thing is I need to put you to sleep. I need to go back. In, I need to go inside of you and I need to take out a large amount of tissue so that we can. You buy up buy these, see it yeah. and fit and and plan your treatments you know your establish your treatment plan based upon what we discover he goes this is what i think we're going to discover he said if we do if we find what i think we're finding that's great because you're you're an 80 percent success rate or you know your that cancer is an 80 percent survival rate mm -hmm. um and and so and I decided, you know, I talked to Dan and he said, he, you know, Dan called me on the phone, Dr. Dan from Squad Fuel, and he said, and he, he did his own research and he goes, yeah, according to this, you know, what is on the internet, that the people who get that have an 80% success rate with treatment. Mm -hmm. He goes, we're going to bump you up to 95 and this is how we're going to do it. And he goes, I want you to get on the keto diet right now. And I talked to Matt Reynolds. Matt Reynolds called me and, and, uh, the, and the day, the day I got the diagnosis was a programmed workout day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had, you know, I, I had my own gym set up in, in an attached garage. And uh, so that morning I got in, I sat down, I talked to my wife and we exchanged hugs and tears and all that. And I went downstairs and I changed my clothes and I turned the radio on and I got under the bar. And when I got under that bar to squat, I, I put my workout weight on there, which used to be some really good workout <laughs> weight. <It used> to, <laughs> yes. You'll get uh, back there. Uh, I put that on there, and as I was about to lift that bar out of that cradle, I said to myself, I said, this isn't for your ego. It's not so you look good in a swimsuit or whatever. You're lifting this weight to save your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're in a competition now. Yeah. The, and, and, I, and I told myself, I said, I, I'm not going to go out without a fight. And, and that, you know, that, that gets into the mentality. You know, you gotta, part of that fight is against gravity. You know, uh, you fight against gravity and, you know, people say fight, but no one ever tells you how no one ever gives you a roadmap. No one ever gives you no one ever like other than, well, we're going to do everything the doctor says. Let me tell you what, as somebody who's been through the system in, out, upside down, backwards and forwards, just let's just do what the doctor says. Mm, it's not, not fight. Enough. No. That's not fighting. That's just being a patient. That's being a chart. Uh, that's being a, a manila folder with a bunch of yeah. statistics in it. You know, you, you need, if you're going to be alive, live. And that is the whole reason that I took the time and, and so effort. So now there is a roadmap. There is somebody telling you what you can do yep. to fight. And if you've got a loved one, if you are going through this personally and you just don't know where to turn, this is a great place. Go to Paul's uh, website, uh, Student of the Gun. Uh, I'm sure it's on Amazon too. Yeah, um, it's on Kindle and Amazon. If if you want uh, the uh, a, a lot of you guys listen to both shows, and if you want a signed copy of the book, uh, what Zach has done, Zach's our store manager. If you go to FightingSauls.com, it'll take you straight to the book. You can pre-order a signed copy, and we're going to throw in a Velcro, glow-in-the-dark Velcro patch that says Fighting Solves Everything. Nice. Yes, Very with nice. everything. Just for so, you leadheads. Yeah, just for you guys. So, uh, yeah, if you go to FightingSolves.com, uh, just follow the instructions, and you're going to get us. Uh, obviously, I don't have th – this just happened. Like, the book just got approved Yeah. Um, you know, on set. In fact, the one right here says not for reason. Yeah, this one's approved. Got to be <laughs> so. And I'm sure uh, that, you know, obviously this is geared toward – you know, fighting cancer, uh, but you can apply this to anything that you're fighting in life, oh, yeah. whether you're going through hardships with a relationship, you're going through a job, you're going through, you know, there's a bazillion different things that, you know, getting you down and feel like you're getting defeated. Um, yeah, it, it's about like shucking off the excuses that are holding you back, uh, not surrendering to your circumstance, you know, whatever circumstance you're in. You know, people find themselves in, in divorce circumstances or disease circumstances or loss of job circumstances or whatever. And you feel you feel like a victim. You feel helpless. Whatever. Let me tell you what. Embracing the victim mentality is not going to help you fight or survive. 
It, 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 it's natural. Everybody wants to do it. I mean, it's the natural human reaction to say, this isn't fair. It shouldn't be happening to me. Yep. Why is it happening to me? You know, I went through the whole battery of emotions. And eventually, and eventually you got to come out on the other side and say, well, yeah, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And this sucks. But if I'm going to be alive, I need to live. And if you're looking for a little bit of motivation, if you're looking for somebody to kick you in their, your ass, um, it, it's like James on the phone grabbing me by the shoulder pads. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know. You guys didn't play football. You never had a coach grab you by the shoulder pads. But um, you grab a face I, mask. Yeah, if you want. Yeah, exactly, or the face mask. The right? face mask. Oh, yeah. If you're looking for a coach to grab you by the face mask and say, look, you know, buck up, there, little tiger. Um, yeah. That's suck it. it up you know that's the whole that's the whole purpose of here, suck it up here to do it you know yeah and, best and advice my dad ever gave me is like um uh, and I'm, i'll summarize it but you know don't rely on anyone else if you want something done you do it yourself you know and that's exactly what you're talking about here is the, the mentality taking the steps physically mentally and don't rely you know don't rely on other people but surround yourself with positive people that are going to help you with your fight too so if you've got negative nancy's surrounding you saying you can't do something it's never be done uh you, know, you need to change your your posse yeah yep. absolutely so uh i want to say two and you things. have a, i just want one more thing said, and you you have a great posse paul you know and i, yeah, I, I, I do I, i'm very fortunate i'll tell you what that was one of the things that came out of this whole cancer thing is that we really found out who how many people support us and also who and it's been kind of amazing but yeah. um if you want the book fighting solves.com go there and uh, you can get the book there. You can get a signed copy. And the other thing that I was going to say was something. Oh, if you are personally going through a journey like a, a cancer treatment or something like that, then let us know. Send us an email and let us know what, what's going on because it's good to talk to other people that have already been through it or are also going through it. Yeah. So info at studentofthegun.com. Send us a message. And if you're personally going through it or you know somebody that is, because we found that the uh, the power of a message um, is is amazing. Yeah, yeah, there is power there definitely. And uh, of course, let heads know talking let gmail dot com, and I will put you in touch with the guys over at Student Again too, if that's easier for you. Yep, very good. makes makes a great Christmas gift. You guys can order these now. Uh, great stocking stuffers, and they have other great things on their website too. So, I mean, you guys have uh, shirts <laughs> and hats. Awesome. And- you know, all coffee mugs in there. And aren't uh, you doing a giveaway thing? Are you doing your manure oh, thing? Oh, advent calendar giveaway, oh, man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you, guys you didn't know. hit me up this year to to send. Oh, down I did. Your... That's right. Didn't what? I did. I don't remember you it. Back. You must not have got the email because I never heard back. Sorry. No, I, I would have th- sent you some ladies and some shirts and patches and stuff. Yeah, man. You still can. <laughs> okay. Okay. If you would like to do that, um, but. The yeah, the advent calendar giveaway. We're giving away almost ten thousand dollars worth of stuff this year. Sweet. A little bit more than last year, um, but you just go to sotgiveaway.com. That's running every single day. We pick a new winner until yep. December twenty fifth. Until Christmas, just like the advent calendar. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. So guys, check them out. Student of the Gun, our good buddies, longtime friends uh, over there, Jared and Paul and Zach running the boards. Zach, we appreciate you today too, buddy. Talking <laughs> lead, AK corner coming up. Make sure uh, you check it the 16th. So as you're listening to this, it's going to be coming out real soon after this episode. Got some of your favorite people on there, Paul. Uh, We've got Brian over at Occam Defense going to be on. We've got Mike Pappas with Dead Air. We've got uh, our buddies from Citry Arms, Anthony. He's he's a newbie to the show. And we've got our good buddy Curtis Halstrom. We're going to be talking about the... uh, uh, Challenges of suppressing an AK-47 and the solutions. So there you go. One you don't want to miss. And we're giving away, oh, by the way, a Canic TP-9 1 Series. I think that's what they call them, right? TP-9 1. Yeah, that's their... uh, The 1 Series. They, what they did is they took the the full size and the compact and and they they're they're basically their price point entry level guns now, and they're calling them the one series. The one series. There you go. Um, so and the truth is those things are they're tanks, man. They won't quit. Those no, they're well, great shooters. Quit. I absolutely love the the Canic. Adam uh, Ranala came up a few couple of months ago, and we went out to Royal Range USA. He brought all the different models, and we opened it up you to our buddy James. 
I, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, James came out for that. Yeah, we had a great time. A lot of you lead heads came out and we got hands on with the the original and their latest and greatest and that new subcompact that they've got. Uh, yeah, really. I mean, I'm sold on. They they convinced me, and that's they they're just tanks, man. They just work. They're they're monotonously reliable. Yeah, I'm adding them to my collection. But yeah, check them out. Canic, uh, Century Arms, uh, the TP9 series. And then, of course, Century Arms is the presenting sponsor of the Talking Lead AK Corner this year. Uh, episode three, we do 12 episodes, and we're giving something away every single episode there. Uh, and then, of course, you know we give stuff away here on our regular show. We've still got the uh, Keltec um, CP33 that we're going to be giving away. Details coming soon. I know I keep saying that, but they, they're coming. We gave away an X-Steel Target's gong last episode. Uh, so the winners just keep on coming at the Talking Lead podcast. Uh, dude, you know what? what the, the only I'm going to go ahead and throw yeah. Kelt in there. I, I saw that the new P17, and it and it doesn't look like it has a threaded barrel. And I'm like, it what? does. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have a threaded barrel. It does. The new P17 does? Okay, good. sweet. Because the, the picture I saw, it looked like it, the barrel was flush with the slide. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw where they said that it does have a, a threaded barrel on there. Okay, fantastic. Details coming soon. Details De- coming soon. Details coming soon on the, the CP33 <laughs> giveaway. Now, speaking of, you know, that that's a 22 long. The news just dropped. Now, I, I want to get you guys' opinion on this, too. You know, Glock just released uh, the G44, their yep. first 22 long, I believe. Yeah. It's only, it only took 20 years. Only, t- I mean, only, and and I mean, all the hate that's out there about it, I don't get it. I mean, why? Uh, they're going to whine either way. Yeah, people are going to whine. People uh, whine that why? it wasn't. <laughs> and they, they whine now that it's hit there. Because they have nothing uh, better to do. Yeah. And, well, it's it's like, all right, for instance, they came out with a 43X and the 48 with stainless slides. Yeah. And, and people bitched. They're like, it doesn't even look like Glock. It's like, you, you're the same idiots that, that were crying that all Glocks are the same color and, and they don't do anything different. So they did something different. And now they had to go back to blue slides because crybabies didn't want the stainless slides. It's like, yeah. And, and, so shut up. Same thing with the serrations on the front, you know, when they didn't do it on the 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 G nineteen X, and then they did it on the next release. You know, mm-hmm. you had people complaining they didn't do it, and then they did it on that one. They had people complaining that they did do it. It's just you're not going to please all the people They've all the time. And Glock that. knows that, and that's why they put out so many different varieties of of guns. Really, and that that's true. That's, that's why we have to have new and improved Tide. I have this <laughs> new concept. Well, no, they have the new improved tide, so those idiots yeah. won't be eating the pods anymore, you know? Oh, yeah, no yeah. The, the, keep out of reach of children. You know what? When I was a teenager, I never ate the laundry detergent. <laughs> I smelled it. You know, it smelled good, but I never put it in my mouth. You know? I used to get, you know, it, when I went to high school, Marty, how old are you? you fit, you're not 50 yet, I'm right? 48. I'm damn near. Okay. But dude, when I went to high school in Ohio, you could bring a note from your parents and smoke at lunchtime. Are you serious? They had a designated smoking area out behind the high school. And yeah, if you brought a note for your parents, you could you could have cigarettes on you and you could go out and smoke. You know, like and people today are like, that's horrible. But you know what we weren't doing when I was eighteen? We weren't looking for safe spaces and eating Tide Pods. Then burning American flags and That's right. We weren't burning American flags. Oh, we were hardcore. Bullshit. <laughs> So make sure you support good, strong American companies like Keltec. Go to keltecweapons.com. Show them the love. They've been running some great specials during uh, the end of the year here. I'm sure they're continuing to crank some stuff out. Uh, and then, of course, SHOT Show. I think they might have some more stuff that they're going to be releasing. We'll keep you posted on that. Modern Spartan Systems for all your gun cleaning lubrication needs. Don't just clean your firearms. Optimize them with Modern Spartan Systems line of products. And, of course, that TVT engine oil additive is going to keep anything you got with an engine running longer and stronger. ModernSpartanSystems.com. Our newest sponsor, uh, we welcome Fioki Ammunition to the family of sponsors. Uh, we said last episode, if you didn't get a chance, go back. Uh, we talk about uh, Fioki and their uh, their line of products. Their, their, I think, four or five generations of history, long family history uh, in that in that company as well. Uh, some great things coming from them for you lead heads in the near future. So go and show them some love, social media, f- uh, websites, Facebook, all that good stuff. Uh, and then, of course, Century Arms, Red Army Standard, U.S. Palm, Occam Defense Solutions, uh, all the f- uh, the, f- the sponsors and, and friends of the show this time of year. This is where you guys are going to get the best deals. Go let them know you're a lead head. 
you've heard all the the codes I've got. Go back to the previous shows. I'm not going to give them here, uh, but we've got all kinds of codes with First Tactical, ASP USA, uh, Medicine in Bad Places, uh, Modern Spartan Systems, and several other places. That's how we bring you all this cool shit each and every week, each and every episode, and the cool guests like the Markles. So, guys, thank you again <laughs> for for joining us, uh, being a part of the Leadhead Brigade. Love you guys. Looking forward to seeing you at Shot Show in just uh, just scant yeah. weeks. Now, now, Jared, I, I will not Jared's, be there this year. They're, they're, they're baby, well, first baby, baby they're, is due January eighteenth. Well, congratulations. It was the well. Maybe Did they change the date? They then? changed it. Now, remember they said the, the first one. Oh, it is. The, it's okay. a late. It's yeah. the first baby, so it could, could, right. it could linger. First baby have a tendency of lingering and holding on to that womb a little longer than normal. When you tell <laughs> Mrs. Fedora, I said, "Bite." <laughs> it's probably going to be a big one. <laughs> she, she's uh, she's, she's not that she's big. growing pretty big. Well, what have they said? Like it was three pounds last time, three pounds ten ounces last time we checked. But that was that was like four weeks ago. Yeah, that was a while ago. So, so that's gonna be so a she's big growing every. It's gonna be a big. Well, congratulations on that, buddy. Uh, but I'll be there, and, and Zach will be there. The shipping over will be there. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna be at the Buck Knives booth, so uh, another awesome uh, sponsor of the Talking Life Buck podcast. Henry, Buck Knives, it makes sense. <laughs> Buck Henry's gonna be at Buck Knives. That's right. So you got to come by and see us over there. Uh, we're gonna have some great interviews like we did last year. We're already starting to line a lot of those up. Um, good stuff coming uh, in the near future. So. All right, guys. Um, any parting words for the Leadhead Brigade? No, uh, but uh, thank you, Marty, for giving me the opportunity to uh, to promote my story and to tell my story. And to, That's my to, pleasure. Uh, this is out here. And uh, now remember, hey, if fighting solves everything, and embrace that. Go with it. Don't let anybody, anybody talk you out of it. That's right. Yeah. Don't so give up. Say thank you to Marty and thank you to those of you that are listening and supporting our friend at Talking Lead. And thank you for listening to the episode that we're on as well. We appreciate it. Any support that you can throw um, to somebody in your life that is going through one of these times, do it because it makes a huge difference. And if you want the book, go to fightingsolves.com. Fightingsolves.com. Very cool. You just want that in your browser history anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and until then, as always, lead heads, keep your loved ones close. Keep your firearms closer. And fighting solves everything. Yeah, brother. Is that good enough? Just don't do anything that would make you lose, Marty. All right, so. I'll come back. Don't worry. You can't get rid of me, man. (laughs) Like you can some things, you can't get rid of me. Yeah, you know, the, I was looking at all the at, fighting in the world. You can't get rid of me, babe. <laughs> I was looking at the uh, at, at old text messages, and I don't even remember how old it was. We were trying to figure out what your country music name was. <laughs> Buck Williams. It, no, it's Buck Henry. Buck Henry. Buck Henry. Yeah. Buck Henry. Buck country Henry. music sensation from Nashville. That's right. I need to get a shirt with that on that. I I started calling you that like in 2013 or something. Yeah, it was at, it was at um, Shot Show. I'd have uh, like a blazer. You had your hair all long and you were all countryed up. I had a I had a freaking uh, like suede blazer on or something. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't that's... even countryed up. <laughs> Are you ready? To, you ready to start? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's let's go ahead and do it, man. Okay. Give me five seconds of silence and I'll I'll kick into my lefty personality. All right. I've I've been told that I have two personalities. There's Marty and then there's Lefty. Mm. I think I'm the same person, but you know. Well, when people meet me in person, they're like, "Wow, that was like you did the show live in front of me." <laughs> <laughs> encore, encore. We got old man syndrome. <laughs>